When I arrived here many years ago as a freshman, there was a Colgate tradition called the Colgate Hello. You were supposed to wear a maroon beanie, and I searched high and low for mine, couldn't find it, a maroon beanie, and say hello to everyone on campus. Now, this was a long time ago. Colgate was still all male, and frankly, lily white. And the idea of a swarm of tweedy young men in weird hats saying hi to each other on a campus in the woods was, well, quaint. Today we'd call it something else. Uh, the tradition faded, but so what? To all of you, to President Herbst, to the faculty and staff, to the Board of Trustees and alumni leaders, to parents and family, and most of all, to the class of 2011. To all of you, I say, hello! <laughs> or to put it in your generation's witheringly ironic voice, hello? Uh, I should speak softly. Uh, there was torchlight last night. Afterwards, or in fact during the ceremony, many of the class of, homage, of, of 2011 were paying homage to the famous spirit that is Colgate, Keystone Light. <laughs> uh, I joke. Uh, Yet the Colgate spirit is real. It's what this place is about. The friendships you make, the mentors you find, the ideas you confront in a peaceful yet exciting community of intellectual, civic, and yes, athletic ambition. If I am any guide, and today I'm supposed to be, this great college will be a constant star, a steady torchlight, as influential as family, faith, or professions. Friends I made here remain friends. One of them is Jim Smith, classmate of mine who's on the Board of Trustees. Uh, my great teachers continue to speak to me across the years. Uh, two of them are here and honored me with their presence. Jerry Balmuth with his ever-present Plato hat, and George Hudson. Thank them. And by, and by thanking them, I want to thank the core of this great college, uh, which is not you or me, and it's not the parents, and it's really not the administrators, much as I love them. It's the faculty. To you. Thank you. And uh, I would also... I'd also say that a big part of this place is the town of Hamilton and the genial people who live here. The graceful beauty of the campus and the Shenango Valley will forever remind you, as they remind me, of what is best about our country, about its history, and about life itself. And I still love the Raiders. Colgate's tucked away in upstate New York, yet most of the nation's leading politicians and certainly most of the governors of New York find their way here. Mario Cuomo, who gave the commencement address years ago, noted that the speaker at this kind of event is like the corpse at an Irish wake. His presence is necessary, but he isn't supposed to say very much. <laughs> so when I was asked to speak, I sought advice. Murray Decock, Class of 80, Vice President for Advancement told me, just be funny. Uh, President Herbst urged me to say something significant about journalism. My colleague and friend at MSNBC, Chris Matthews, said very emphatically, 11 minutes. <laughs> Do not speak for more than 11 minutes. 
Uh, I'll do my best. To be speaking to you now is the honor of a lifetime. And I am especially thankful to everybody, but especially to Professors Balmuth and, and Hudson, who taught me in class and had more than enough evidence to prevent my getting an honorary degree if they had wanted to. A Colgate commencement isn't always a good omen. Four presidential nominees have spoken at commencement. I looked it up. Great men, all losers. <laughs> New York Governor Elliot Spitzer, I haven't gotten to the joke yet. <laughs> New York Governor Elliot Spitzer was the last to speak at an outdoor exercise over by Taylor Lake. A torrential downfall, a downpour ruined the ceremony just as he was telling the graduates, quote, anything is possible. <laughs> you know the rest of the story. You're applauding Elliot Spitzer, okay. Uh, in my day here, things were changing at a dizzying pace too. I think my class of 70 and your class of 2011 share that quality. In the spring of 1968, just to show you how much and how quickly things changed, in the spring of 68, I attended the last best toga party in American history. Of course, as it was at the Beta House, we had wineskins, and turkey drumsticks strewn about, and a fountain in the living room. Yet that same spring, I was one of about 500 Colgate students who occupied the administration building for three days to protest what? Fraternity discrimination. By the following year, the students who had led that protest had formed the Association of Black Collegians. For most of my time here, we had to drive to Skidmore or Vassar or Smith to meet women. By my senior year, Colgate was admitting its first coeducational co class. As a Maroon Cub reporter, I wrote about silly pranks. As editor-in-chief four years later, I wrote about Vietnam, Cambodia, the draft lottery, and the first Earth Day. <laughs> I, I told my son that I had written an editorial about the first Earth Day, when it was happening, to which he said, I, you really are old. <laughs> okay, 40 years later, you're living in a time of similarly rapid change, as President Herbst mentioned. You have grown up in and with the digital world. When you were in grade school, the following things did not exist or barely existed. iTunes, smartphones, iPads, Google, Wikipedia, Skype, eBay, Flickr, Craigslist, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Foursquare. Uh, uh, in other words, your whole existence. In the 60s, our challenge was to deal with social change at home and a new global consciousness abroad. Your challenge is to navigate in and lead in a digitally connected world. It's an exciting, even exhilarating time. The breathtaking promise of it is why I left Newsweek after 30 years and joined the Huffington Post. Each one of you has access to more information than anyone in history, times a million. The internet empowers the powerless from Tunisia to Tahrir Square. It connects old friends and new across the street and across the globe. In my day at Colgate, we gathered in front of the television set at an appointed hour to be told the news from Vietnam by an anchor man sitting at a desk. To get access to the Associated Press Wire, the most fundamental source of information in the country, you had to work in a newsroom, otherwise you couldn't see it. Now each of you has the planet updated on your smartphone anytime, anyplace. Instead of an anchor man talking at you, you are immersed in web pages, blogs, apps, emails, videos, pictures, tweets, texts, instant messages. You can read the news, but just as important, you can interact with it. 
and talk about it in the very same place you get it. All wonderful, but there is a but. There's always a but. And the truth is that the digital, the digital world is also a dangerous one in which the real can be less vivid than the virtual and in which facts, verifiable facts, can be disastrously malleable and elusive. Luckily, there are lots of Colgate leaders in this media-centric world we have created. Colgate doesn't have a journalism or a filmmaking program, per se. At a small liberal arts university, we shouldn't. Still, no college of our size has produced more leaders in these fields. For example, Colgate people today run NBC Universal, CBS News in 60 Minutes, the Fox Network, just to name a few. There are legions of Colgate people in Hollywood as screenwriters, as documentary filmmakers and directors of every type from the mailroom to the corner office. I thought it was a good idea to ask some of them for life advice for you, so here you go. Nothing is beneath you, said Jeff Fager, the head of CBS News. To the contrary, accept and excel at everything in front of you, no matter how menial or tedious, and you will excel in life. Jeff is obviously in the market for interns, so if any of you want to call him, please do. Uh, Howie Katz, who was once a Maroon sports editor, later head of ABC Sports, and now uh, the chief of the NFL network, stressed fearlessness. Take chances, he said. Be true to your values, speak your mind, and don't be afraid to lose your job. Howie and I have never discussed his career path. I might have missed something there. Um, I like this one from Gloria Borger. 74, who is a CNN reporter and analyst. She was the first woman editor of the Colgate Maroon and also a Watson Fellow. Her sage advice is this. Remember, it is not who you know, it's whom you know. <laughs> English faculty. Gloria was an English major. Steve Burke, who some of you may know, president and CEO of NBC, and now one of my bosses because I work for NBC as well as HuffPost, said that when he gave his commencement speech and sat on this stage, he noticed one thing. Almost every graduate who crossed the stage to pick up his or her diploma was wearing flip-flops. I think his implied advice was, casual is fine. Finally, Chase Carey, who's the CEO of Fox, stressed friendship. Always pursue your goals with passion and energy, he said. And if things get really tough, call a Colgate friend for a beer. Speaking of which, uh, I couldn't do this without contacting the Colgate men who have had, in recent decades, the most profound influence on American culture. I refer, of course, to Broken Lizard. They're the Hollywood comedy troupe that got its start here. Cinema buffs know that Broken Lizard created two masterpieces, Super Troopers and Beer Fest. I should add that members of the troupe were, what else, betas. Here, courtesy of the great Kevin Heffernan, who played Farva in Super Troopers, are a few of Broken Lizard's most important nuggets of wisdom for new Colgate students. That's how they labeled it. Here you go. If possible, set up a business where you work for 20 years with your best friends from Colgate. Get paid to make people laugh. It's totally fun. When you make a movie about cops, make the cops cool and funny. It will keep you out of jail. <laughs> if you're ever on a bus tour, with Willie Nelson, just say no. <laughs> it's all from Broken Lizard. If you are unsure about what to do with your lives, try the entertainment industry. It's really easy. There are lots of available high paying jobs and you won't have to show your birth certificate. This is my favorite. If you ever act in a movie, 
Don't do a nude scene on a cold day. <laughs> and finally, when you receive your diploma and shake hands with President Herbst, he likes it if you give him a little pinch on the cheek and tell him he's cute. <laughs> Don't do that. All right, so that's the advice from the world of entertainment and journalism. Here's my advice about journalism. As wondrous as this new media is, world is, we need your help. This is where your Colgate education comes in. It gives you the inspiration and capacity, and I would even say the duty, to be your own editor and reporter. The Colgate emblem, which I'm staring at right here behind, behind you on the wall, don't forget, is an upraised arm holding a torch to light the path to truth. Think of yourself as having embodied, at least symbolically, that image last night at Torchlight. You have the minds and the means to help journalism thrive and see that American democracy survives along with it. Technology is what's made your involvement possible and necessary. My business is in the midst of the biggest transformation since the advent of television, if not Gutenberg's printing press. But technology also enables people to spin comforting cocoons around themselves and create a false sense of their own reality. If there's no shared reality, there is no shared society. In no way to argue about anything, which is what I wrote a book about, let alone agree on anything. In this new age, speed is all, and now is not soon enough. As Mark Twain observed, a lie can race halfway around the world before truth can put on its shoes. Today, it's far worse. A lie can cover the globe in a nanosecond, and the truth may never be heard. Well, what are we supposed to do? Number one, in this new era, editors are more important than ever before. But professional editors can't police a global mega swarm of content, which is why editing and reporting are the responsibility now of us all. If war is too important to be left to the generals, the news business is too sprawling and chaotic to be left just to the journalists. Being informed is no longer a passive process, if it ever was. You have to be active participants in becoming and staying connected to the world. Brief guide to how to do that, Journalism 101 in, in two minutes. Never assume, never assume, Jacques Ellul, who was a, 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 a famous French philosopher and sociologist, noted that the real danger in propaganda is not the flat-out lie, but the half-truth, the twisted truth, the truth taken out of context. The best antidote to propaganda is skepticism, informed skepticism. Never rely on one source be it a person, a newspaper, a website, a tweet, a government official. Even the New York Times, a paper I revere, edited by friends of mine, can be wrong. So, by the way, can the Huffington Post. Know your sources, their motives, and their biases. Next point, decide, as the late David Foster Wallace said in a terrific commencement address of a few years ago before he died. It's not the question of how to think. You know how to think. It's a question of what to think about, what you choose to notice in this very busy world. That's a journalistic decision. It's also a moral one. Treasure verifiable facts. The late Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who spoke at Colgate at commencement in 1977, had a famous dictum. He said, Everyone is entitled to his or her own opinion, but not to his or, own, his or her own facts. Another point, leave your comfort zone. Read the other side, the other sides. If you watch MSNBC, and I hope you do, watch Fox too, and vice versa. It won't kill you. 
Scan websites as far away from your own thinking as you can. Talk to people whose views differ from your own. As Nietzsche said, whatever doesn't kill you will make you stronger. Except possibly Glenn Beck. Uh, remember what is real. A Skyped person in front of you is not really in front of you. Google Earth is not Earth. Talking to people face to face, almost iris to iris, is indispensable because sadly it is increasingly rare. Traveling to distant countries and cultures as you do on Colgate study groups is crucial because doing it is way, virtually is way too easy now. You need the extra dimension. Beware of crowds, would be something else I would say. The Google algorithm can help you find what you need before you finish typing in the search term, but Google and like programs can also fuel what I would think of as the tyranny of crowds, because it can reinforce conformity. Honor your country, which despite its flaws remains what Abraham Lincoln called the last best hope of Earth. We have unique freedom here to be our own editors, reporters, bloggers, commentators. But the only way to protect our freedoms is to exercise them, and I trust that you will do so. Finally, remember the personal relationships, the friends you make, the mentors you have here, your family, your loved ones, are truer guides to reality than any technology ever can be. Now, if all these instructions sound familiar, it's because you've already absorbed them. That's what a Colgate education is about. The paradox of our upstate isolation, which was an old knock on Colgate, is now the saving essence of it, in my view. Colgate offers the opposite of a fragmented, distracted, virtual world. It is an intimate, face-to-face -face community on a hill, on study groups around the world, a cheerful oasis of learning, research, and possibility. Take the power of technology and temper it with the habits and the skills of relationship building that you learned here. Do that and we'll all be better off. So now members of the class of 11, Go forth and carry the Colgate torch into the digital future. And as you do, take with you our love, our best wishes, and our faith that you will forge a better, more comprehensible world. And as the guys of Broken Lizard say, don't do a nude scene in the cold. Thank you all very much.